So welcome to uh, people. Uh, we'll give it another minute or so just to make sure everybody's had plenty of time to join in. Uh, and then we'll do the initial introductions before seating. Just a little bit of housekeeping right at the start. Uh, this Great. We may have lost Greg, so I'll just go over the housekeeping slides okay. just now. So just to let everyone know, you are automatically muted and your camera is turned off um, for the duration of this webinar. We are also recording it. And um, so if you're uncomfortable with that, um, we would ask you to leave um, now. So we'll wait for Greg to come back in or Khaled. I don't know if you're wanting just to start i think he's just dropped out of connection as it does on these live webinars so here he comes <laughs> oh i'm back my internet connection just dropped out completely no worries we've just gone through the housekeeping slides just there greg for you so i don't know if you're wanting to do a quick introduction as well okay apologies for that everybody um i'll be turning my camera off as soon as i've handed over to Khaled. uh I just want to say this is the result of almost two years' work uh, over three phases, starting early in uh, 2019 and culminating in five high-level uh, high level assessments of five different uh, grid designs. Uh, the work has been undertaken by Dr. Khaled Ahmed and Dr. Mohammed. Elginity uh, from the University of Strathclyde, with input from a number of operators, but also ABB, uh, SSE, and importantly, Sealand. Uh, and with that, I will hand over to Khaled. Thanks, Greg. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you for joining us today in uh, such a webinar. And uh, what we try to do today, just to answer these questions, how to electrify UK continental shops, oil and gas platforms. Uh, so hopefully you'll find something beneficial for every one of you. Uh, we do uh, uh, understand and appreciate that the background of the people who are attending uh, is different and we will try to not to go deeply in the technical bit but give you some uh, of uh, the flavors of what have been done in the project and before we start just a brief introduction about myself and my background my name is Khaled Ahmed uh, I am a reader in power electronics at University of Strauss client and I am one pro one of the senior academics at the Institute of uh, Energy and the Environment uh, my, my background in grid integrations, renewable integrations, for I, I have been now working in this area for the last 15 years. Uh, HVDC, renewables for solar and wind, uh, especially for offshore integration. And of course, uh, in light of what is going on now and all the pressure to go for uh, achieving the target of uh, 2050 net zero, uh, the integrations with the oil and gas platform and going for electrification of oil and gas platforms, uh, it's must now and it's essential to take it forward. So, and my role, uh, uh, this project, it, it is funded from OGTC. We 
discussing this project more than two years ago. And finally, we received the support from the full uh, members of OGTC. And uh, the project started in June 2019. Uh, I am, my role here is a project manager at Stras Client. And uh, uh, we have dedicated researchers who did the work under my supervision. And uh, this is what we basically will do. So uh, the plan for today, after a brief introduction of uh, uh, Stras Client a little bit, we will talk about the project's aim and objectives. Then we will move to give you some facts about the UK continental jobs. Uh, then we will focus on the project activity, what we have done for uh, uh, these 18 months. And then uh, some of these potential power architectures, which Greg mentioned. And finally, our uh, outcomes and recommendations for going forward. Stras Client University, uh, it's one known university uh, in or over UK. We are uh, uh, have a good reputations and world leading uh, uh, activities in teaching and innovations. We are one of the top 20 university for research intensity. We have received a couple of uh, 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 times uh, uh, higher education awards. We are also received the five star overall rating from the university ratings. Uh, we have high number of students uh, in Scotland, 22,000 students and over uh, from 100 university. Part of our strategic themes, as you can see on the slide, it is the energy. And we can claim that we have the largest research cluster in Europe. Uh, this is basically under what we called it. Uh, we have under the energy themes, different area of expertise. It starts from energy policy. My team and myself, we are focusing on these three areas, oil and gas, power networks, and smart grids, and renewable energy. All this will be under the umbrella of the Institute of Energy and Environment with the engagement with Power Networks uh, Demonstration Center. Uh, the institute that I belong to, and I am one of uh, its senior uh, academics, we have around 34 academic staff, 75 plus research staff, 150 research students, a team technical and admin staff. So it's big institute. And uh, under this institute, we have four main uh, research group it started from advanced electric systems, high voltage technology, my group, the BEDIC group, power electronics, drive and energy conversion group, and finally, the wind energy uh, uh, control. Of course, we have specialists in the four area, but we are also integrating with each other because nowadays, as you know, it is integrating approach in activity and research. This is the way to go forward. Uh, our institute, we are very productive and active research, especially our funding come through two main sources. Basically, the research institute like EBSRC in the UK, more than 20 1 million plus and our annual research spend around 6 million. Uh, we have deep engagement with industry as well. Part, uh, a big part of our activities with industry uh, from manufacturing like Rolls-Royce, General Electric uh, 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 and some of the activity with utility companies like SSE and Scotch Power. Recently, also, we have some activities with oil and gas companies, as we will highlight it later. We have three main sites. This is the Royal College, which it is in the heart of the city center of Glasgow, Technology uh, 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 and uh, Innovation Center, plus the PNEDC, which we have there uh, actually capability of testing at one megawatt. The facilities, we are uh, at Strasclite, we have very good hardware facilities, starting from uh, real-time simulators, which it can emulate and model a uh, very complex system like the UK networks and testing uh, at real time. So this is basically to validate the uh, controller and the algorithms that we are proposing. We have also uh, very good facilities for the power electronics converters testing uh, for different applications. 
uh, our dynamic labs, it includes a, a, a diversity of different generators and motors, which can be also for different applications. Uh, the facilities of the power network demonstrators, as I highlighted, it can test system to around one, gig, one uh, uh, megawatt level. And uh, another advantage that it is just in front of the HVDC center, national center, which uh, managed by SSE. So after this brief introduction, uh, let's go to uh, the project aims and the objectives that uh, we are uh, we're talking about it today. So the project, basically, it is, it's aimed to try to develop uh, the suitable power system architectures uh, uh, for the UK continental shelf through uh, interconnectivity and achieve significant operational benefits. This is basically can be achieved these objectives by three main. Uh, uh, this aim, sorry, can be achieved by three different objectives. First of all, we need to understand what are the, the existing power system on the platform itself and its operational requirements then we need to identify the opportunities. To unlock these opportunities, you need to understand first what is exist, then we start to see the different interconnecting options with the offshore uh, power infrastructures, considering, of course, renewables uh, and oil and gas systems. And finally, try to develop the suitable power for the future, especially for the small pool. Our industry partners in the project, Scottish Southern Energy, utility company, and EBB, as they are one of the key players for oil and gas uh, sector. Uh, so to achieve this target or this aim, we have divided the project to three main phases during this period. The first phase, which we spend around four months during this phase, uh, as I mentioned, what is exists on for the UK continental shelf? What where are the locations, for example, of uh, uh, the platforms, the amount of the power, uh, and all these informations we imported through the GIS data onto our softwares, and then we defined the load types on the platform itself. Then we start to look for the different uh, uh, platform. We call it platform because we mean at the individual platform level power architectures and then this take us to the another step or the second phase which we mentioned okay after we know what is the suitable for the platform itself how we can cluster these options for going for a bigger picture uh, concept and this is why we came with the idea of the power hub how we can have a power hub and the, also it's integrated at the platform level this is what we did in the second phase. Uh, and then by the end of the second phase, we had a meetings with uh, the operators and we agreed on these five power architectures to be taken for further uh, technical assessment for the rest of the project until the end uh, uh, of it. So just to start, we aiming again that we know very well uh, and it has been estimated uh, by uh, OGA that 3 billion actually barrels of oil equivalent uh, it is uh, uh, and it, it is remaining in for the UK connector shelves and it is across uh, different locations so uh, and the, unfortunately the majority of them are small pool and small pool for the people who don't uh, hear this word a lot what does it mean it means as it has been defined it's a if the, uh, the location is 50 million per uh, uh, equivalent is technically recoverable, this will be called a small pool. So our aim, it tends to offer parts or to be part of the energy transition solutions for the oil and gas platforms in the future. Why to provide the clean green energy for the future and efficient, durable and cost effective, of course, power supply and sustainable solutions for the future installations for such projects. We have a massive number of platforms uh, for the oil and gas. It's, uh, it's, it has been mentioned it's more than 300 platforms. And we have also around uh, 12,000 kilometers of pipelines. So there is a massive and sus suspicious, uh, is, is massive uh, amount of resources and infrastructures for the UK container shelves. How can we be 
used for the future. So some of the facts of the UK continental shelves, everyone know that now toward moving uh, or to move to the uh, low carbon economy is more pressing now, especially in the light to achieve the net zero uh, 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 greenhouse gases by 2050. And 40% of the reductions from 1990, all right, as we can see in the screen here, it has been achieved by the sector of energy. And this is thanks to uh, the, uh, uh, the growth in the remote plus of course changing to gas. So is it enough? Is this the end of the story? Unfortunately, that uh, the UK continental shelf oil and gas platform, they are uh, uh, actually all here. There is a 3% of the data of 2018. It's come from the emissions come from the oil and gas uh, uh, sections. So the UK uh, also, uh, 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 oil and gas industry has been committed uh, uh, just uh, that they will decrease or they cut the operational emissions by 50% 2030 and 90% by 2040 uh, in June 2020, just uh, four months ago. So uh, this means uh, actually uh, a big uh, uh, actually achievement and this will lead to uh, a game changing in all the uh, ongoing now activities on oil and gas platforms, as you will see later. Also, none of the UK continental ships of shell installations right now are connected to the national grid for power supply. All of them just, we have a gas turbines or diesel engines on the platform itself and to feed the power. So all, what are the options, how we can go for the future to meet this uh, 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 aim and just, it's the information for everyone. The UK container shelf productions meet more than around uh, uh, actually three quarter of the oil, uh, UK oil demands and half of the UK's gas demand. So if we be able to decrease the emission associated with these resources from the UK container shelf, this will make up a large proportion of the UK total gas uh, house uh, gases emissions. And it has been also confirmed that 74% of the CO2 emissions were generated uh, uh, in uh, actually from uh, co uh, combustion equipment, which is provide basically the power uh, and drive compressor for oil and gas. And just to explain the electrification in very simple words for everyone, what we need to do, electrification of the off offshore oil and gas installations can of course definitely significantly reduce the emissions. Why? By, by two main forms. Firstly, we would like to supply the low carbon electricity or supply low carbon electricity from renewables, right? For existing electric loads and plus all replacing the open cycle gas turbines that drive the mechanical uh, uh, loads like the compressors by using electric mo motors. So this is change on the ground of doing so. So the first phase of the project, as I was talking, it was very important for us to understand the potential and the resources that we have for the oil and gas uh, 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 industry in general in the North Sea. This is why we started by using the Arc GIS software to import all the locations of uh, uh, the uh, installations and it, it should be up to date. So we started by up to date UK offshore oil and gas installations and the Lyncest area as well, because this is, will help us to know where are the green field will be and so on. And this is also give us indications uh, uh, after we imported all the data, how we can integrate it with other resources in the North Sea. And this is why the second step we did that we start to import also uh, uh, actually the alliances existing and the blend uh, uh, actually went forms for the national uh, for the North Sea. Uh, after this step, why we selected the wind, why we didn't take into account the other resources, I will talk about it in a minute. Uh, but all these data is updated, uh, and we obtained, of course, the wind one from the Crown State and the Scottish Government 
published map uh, uh, for the current operations and offshore wind farms, as I mentioned, the licensed and the planned one. Then we, as you can see on the screen now, on these slides, this is both together. No one can deny that there will be overlap in the areas. As you can see here, this is at the south of the uh, uh, North Sea. And if we go up around Shetland, this is the east and west. Of course, there will be overlap as well. And here in the central part of it. So definitely, there is a future and a massive opportunity to be taken forward for the integrations between the wind farm activities when wind renewables in general terms and uh, the oil and gas platforms. Uh, why we selected the wind and we didn't. Oh, it's not responding. Sorry. Technology, it's not responding. Just one second. So it's turned back. So actually, why we selected the wind energy? Now the offshore wind energy installations, as you know, it's 8.6 gigawatt, and there is a further 2.9 gigawatt under construction. So it means by the end of uh, uh, by the end of 2020, we will have 11 gigawatts installed capacity, and it's planned by 2023. So to two, three years time, so we'll have 14.5 gigawatt. So there is a massive, uh, actually, amount of wind energy in the field. Of course, I totally agree that the wave and tidal as well, there is a big potential, especially for the UK here, for uh, taking forward. Uh, and there was a massive energy that it can be also integrated. But this is the most mature and available technology right now. And this is the way forward for the short term, at least. However, nothing is perfect. So unfortunately, 80% of the UK contention shares offshore wind resources, potentially it is at the depth greater than six meters. And the fixed bottom, which is the technology right now, they are, uh, are no longer viable options, basically. And we need to go for the floating offshore wind. A floating offshore wind, yes, it's available, but unfortunately it's still its cost is quite high. It's double, basically, the cost of the fixed one. And this is one of the main challenges that's facing the floating uh, uh, wind. And this is what all the researchers nowadays is trying to take this cost down and the key players in the field. We, we are very proud that we have the first uh, projects, high wind, uh, here in Scotland. And it's just 15 mile from Aberdeen uh, with just five uh, uh, turbines, which rated uh, each at six megawatts to the total the power is 30 megawatts. This is in 2017. Uh, and it, it looks to me, it's a promising from following up that it has been ignored, of course, they are leading in this field. So they mentioned that by 2023, they are intending to decrease the cost, the capex cost to 50% and they are expecting by 2030 the realized cost of energy will be between 40 to 60 euros per megawatt hour for future float wind. This is, will be very promising. But where we are now, we are talking about between 85 to uh, 100 uh, pounds mega, uh, mega, uh, per megawatt hour. Uh, uh, this is definitely, it, it should come uh, to at least half of this amount to be uh, actually uh, uh, promising options. We have also uh, technical issues with the floating, especially uh, how have compared to uh, the other one, like the floating, how, how will be the connections, uh, the cables, the cable should be dynamics, if it will be disconnected or connected, if we will use it. I will talk about it later in more depth, but this one of the things. And plus also the government and the policy maker need to take a role here uh, to have a clear, let's say, route to the markets of the floating wind industry to take off the commercial, let's say, skill. Uh, uh, but no one can deny this is one of the leading area that UK should take uh, a lead. All right, then we move to understand or try to understand what 
are the oil and gas platform load types, what are exist on the platform itself. Uh, and we can divide the loads to two main types. The first is for the service uh, operations and the subsea operations. Uh, we found that the power demand we are talking uh, in the range between 10 megawatt to 100, uh, a few hundreds of megawatts. This is in general speaking, but there is of course some of the platform with lower power, some of them it's around two to three megawatts. So it depends basically. Uh, 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 and the, the electric power heat is required for drilling and oil and gas extractions. Power is also needed for uh, separation, produce and uh, actually store the oil and gas and so on. And of course, for the normal activities on the platform itself. Then we were thinking, we would we were keen to know, is it actually will add the value of going for electrifications for oil and gas uh, platforms? This is why we thought it will be very useful to know the amount of power for the whole UK containership, how much power that uh, it consumes. And it was very difficult to get such data from all uh, uh, from public sources or by approaching uh, operators. So we thought it will be a good idea by estimating the power from the emissions, because as you are aware, that the operators report the CO2 emissions level from the individual platform operations. And this is why we used the amount of the emissions, all right, and we multiply by 74%, because of course, this is the amount of the power generations, and we divide it for the amount for the year. And there is something called, we call it emission factor. The emission factor, this is the emission intensity factor. This is the relations between the CO2 per kilowatt hour. Uh, and this number is very important and it has been uh, confirmed and it has been published actually by Scottish government uh, energy uh, 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 sector. And it's, it's actually, as you can see, it's around 46 gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. This is quite high number. The onshore generation, it will be half of this amount. We'll talk about it later as well. We, we found it, it is around 2.4 gigawatts. This is around 8% of our consumption right now. Uh, and of course, if we will add the heat power or heat load as well, this demand will be more and we'll talk about 3.6 gigawatts. So it's, it's a good amount of power and a decent amount of power that we should look after. So then we start to try to understand what are the existing platform electrification methods? What are the ongoing activity? Of course, the most common and famous, let's say, exist technology. It is just by uh, uh, supplying the power from onshore, uh, uh, regardless of the method, or by using HVDC, high voltage direct current, or HVAC, high voltage AC. And this is the most common one. Of course, uh, they are very, very active, uh, uh, our colleagues. At, at the Norwegian continental shelves. So uh, almost all the activities in the North Sea at their site. Uh, we have, of course, one of the very oldest electrification projects for Troll A. It has been started in 2005 and uh, it has been upgraded as well a couple of times. So we are talking about 188 uh, megawatts and of course using technology of HVDC. And we will find something very interesting here. When you look at the projects which supplied by HVDC and HVAC, you will find that when the distance is longer, we will go for HVDC, but this is not always the, the, the story because sometimes the distance is very, very long, but still AC will be cheaper because the power will be low. So it's a combination of both the power plus the distance. And this is basically always the comparison between them. This is the main two technologies that exist, using HVDC or AC from onshore to power the platform. That's it. One of the activity that it has been uh, approved by the Norwegian, again, government, that to supply couple, actually five platforms, in, again, in the North Sea, by 11 uh, wind turbines, which generate 88 megawatts. But they are not going to have fully electrified option 
So they will just supply the power of 35% of the true oil fields. All right, the project, it is not running. It, it is planning to be commissioned by 2022. So we can say the other technology that it exists right now, it is uh, uh, supplying the power from onshore by AC or DC. This is one of the promising options. However, it is not exist right now. Another uh, option, which is as well, why not to uh, actually supply uh, the power or coordinate the power between a couple of platforms? Why? Because basically the efficiency of the old gas turbine, it is around 20%. Some of the very old platform even it can reduce to 13%. This is quite low. So what in the new gas turbines, the efficiency can reach 40%. And I just heard that recently, two months ago, that there is a prototype now to try to achieve efficiency for around 60%. So if we will be able to integrate platform together and the one with the old and the new gas turbines, definitely this will enhance the efficiency and will decrease the losses. One of the projects that it has been taking this forward, it is uh, uh, one of their platform in Norway. It is heavy uh, platforms, try to supply uh, the power from the nearby platforms. It has a bunch of disadvantage like any engineering solutions. The main advantage, of course, is very clear, more effective utilization of the generators and the great less emissions. Uh, and we don't need any more for emergency power on the platform itself. But of course, coordinating the power and the operations uh, between the platforms, it need more uh, in-depth investigation. So when we say the window of opportunities, as you can see, generally speaking, the methodology based on the available technology and the CAPEX, of course, which you decide. This curve here, ABB, uh, uh, published from a couple of years by the relation between the cable lens and the power. When the power is very, very, very low, it will be very difficult to compete uh, with uh, the capex causes with between the on-platform gas turbines and HV, AC, or DC. And when the power increased and the length increased, this is why we will go for the HV, DC. What we believe here that the future will be like this. This is, will be the future curve. It will be a combination between the three. The, on, uh, on, on platform gas turbines, the offshore wind power, because we do believe that connecting to the local offshore wind power, this is especially for uh, 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 brownfields, this is, will be the best option for the future. Going for electrification from onshore, this is, will add a lot of cost, which I doubt this will compensate the operation cost uh, or the OPEX of the uh, uh, platform. All right. Then we move to the power architectures. We start to uh, uh, pick up what are the power architectures at the platform level. Then we came to mainly five options at the platform. The first option, it's very clear that we just connect uh, uh, the platform from sure, uh, AC or DC, or we can connect it to the nearest interconnector or HVDC link. And we will talk about it later. The second option that we have dedicated floating wind turbines that it is uh, feeding the power entirely to the oil and gas platforms. But in this case, energy storage will be a key. The system cannot operate without energy storage. Uh, option three, we can have ongoing already offshore uh, wind farms, especially in the central North Sea, it, this can be integrated with the platform. But here, the platforms also will be integrated to each other. And you can see here in the figures, uh, I draw two different scenarios. One, one, one of the scenarios here, this is we call the closed mesh. What does it mean? All the platforms are connected to each other. This will help the security of the supply, plus the performance coordinations between them. Or this is what we call the open mesh. 
everything has its advantages advantage, but the point that we can raise it here and the other we draw it here that some of the platform we will not need any of gas turbines at all this will lead of course to lower emissions and some we will have the gas turbines again to manage uh, the power and to decrease uh, the energy storage if we need it so this is just to let you see the number of uh, the opportunities and how to go forward and the different uh, configurations which lead to optimization the system to for better performance option four here we will have again the offshore wind farm uh, uh, and the connecting to the platform however we will have also a link of onshore link from onshore or the interconnector what is the main advantage the main advantage in this system you will not be or it will not require any energy storage we can proceed without energy storage and in this case the system uh, 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 will find the security of the supply by such connection finally the fifth options which we do believe this is the best option for the brown field that the connecting the platforms together and manage the power between them this is will be uh, the simplest and cheapest option for going forward so uh, to answer these questions what are the many challenges on modifying or upgrading the especially the brown field oil and gas platforms there is a lot to be mentioned here, but just to summarize them to four main technical challenges. For the technical challenges, when we talk about the distance between the platform, uh, uh, it, the AC cost is limited, as we mentioned before, about the distance and voltage level. DC need equipment to be fixed, like the converter and so on. Uh, uh, this is everything it needs to be studied separately. The weight, the structure, the strains, the center of gravity, the balance, uh, this should be taken into account. Uh, one platform can be a floating vessel, as you know, in oil and gas sector, and other may be fixed. This means that you, it will be the required dynamic cable to tie in. Coordinating uh, between the platform generators, if required, this is, will be also interesting like we will need a relay coordinations different control system uh, again if you have a different frequency this is also one of the challenges that it may meet uh, maritime uh, challenges the layout of course and pull in of the subsea cables especially for the floating wind it's tricky uh, we need of course to have a maneuver of the boat close to the platform uh, other subsea installations, the pipelines, the cables, all this uh, should be taken into account. Uh, sea bed conditions, sea bed uh, depth, and weather conditions for the operations because we have a limited access, as you know, and so on. Business challenges will be under different operating companies on their respective platforms. This is one of the main challenges, of course, different engineering and database out of data i mean on the platform itself different constructions uh, there is no standards different vendors and uh, building uh, uh, countries as you know especially in the north sea uh, environment of course the main environment the challenge with will be to reduce the co2 emissions then after we came to the conclusion all right we now have options five variable options for going or to be taken forward for oil and gas platform at the platform level why we don't have a bigger pictures to take it for further uh, 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 options which it enhances the performance and also will give better uh, uh, lower emissions and lower cost this is why we come with this concept of building hubs. Why not to build hubs for the UK continental ships? And these hubs locations, of course, can be different depending on different factors, as we will see later, uh, along uh, the UK continental ships. The hub here will be always divided to two main parts. The first part, which it is receiving the power from the interconnector or the nearby offshore wind farm. This is what we call it the importer, imported power. It will need to go through a conversion stage if it is AC or DC, how we are going to 
uh, 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 deal with the car, and then we will go for director stage depending on the platform. So what I need to say here is that, uh, generally speaking, these hubs will be integrated, all right, with all the previous uh, uh, platform level electrifications to have the full picture. And it, just to give you uh, just, uh, Yep. So this is how it looks the hub. Basically, here the hub, the input can be coming from onshore power grid and the nearby offshore farm. So we you need, depending on the power and the shape of the power, you need to go through conversion stage. And then all the platforms, gas, uh, oil and gas platform will be connected through the output here. Uh, different options. We have studied different options for the transmission. Because uh, nowadays, uh, all right, we can use HVDC or HVAC. This is a common one, uh, all right, between uh, uh, the hub itself and the grid. Uh, and the same thing for the offshore wind farm. However, there is ongoing now activities and research activities by using low frequency AC transmission. By decreasing the frequency, of course, this will decrease the losses as well. And when we say decreasing the frequency 15.7 hertz, all right, it's a very good alternative actually instead of using the HVDC. Why? Because you not need to have a converter uh, basically at the offshore uh, uh, farm, and you are going to save the cost of building these converters and the space. However, the technology is not mature enough right now, and we need more space and to have it at the commercial level. So also the connections of the platforms, as we highlighted before, there is different options. This is what we called it, the star connections. This is a closed mesh. This is the open mesh. Every connection has its advantage, disadvantage, and we compared between them to be also taken on board. Then we came to these three main scenarios. Scenario A, that we will have power coming through the inputs here as AC. We don't have any converters, it just will be transformer. And then we will have the director stage, which will find or convert the power to the suitable rating of the oil and gas platforms, depending on the requirement. Or the other option in scenario B, to have DC of uh, coming through uh, the onshore, and the other one, it is uh, still DC, uh, AC normally. And the third scenario, which it is more interesting, that we will call it isolate. It's freezed again. Sorry, it's freezed. The third option will be not um, the screen squeezed. Yep, the third option here is that it's isolated network. So basically, we will have the two nearby offshore farm connected to the hub, and it is feeding basically. Uh, 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 the local all the oil and gas platforms, and there is no any uh, uh, actually connecting to the grid at all. Every of these scenarios has its advantage and disadvantage, but due to the time limitations, it was difficult to cover it right now. And then we start to think where it should be the hub. Immediately, the first idea came to us to reuse the decommissioned platform. And which one to be used? Because as you are aware, in the coming decade, we will have around 100 uh, uh, platforms, as it has been announced, of uh, uh, the oil and gas platform will be decommissioned. So this is will happen. Why not to be uh, able to reuse this platform for such hubs, or in general speaking, to be used for HVDC uh, substations as well for interconnector and so on. And we did some studies because of course the main will be the top side weight how much weight uh, we can 
fix it on the platform, the top side part to be used. And by studying these options, we take it into account. And also something we put it into our accounts, we search and we focus on the gravity based structures. Why? Because it has very slow degrade uh, uh, actually feature. And this is why also this should be taken into account. And if we can't go for this, one of the options also to use uh, uh, the bridge link jacket to, to enhance the capability of the platform itself. Then we start to think about the different uh, potential options in each of the UK continental trade regions. Like here, uh, if in the east of Shetland, where is the best uh, hubs location, let's say, to be integrated with the oil and gas platforms and uh, the off, uh, offshore uh, uh, farm and as well. Here for the west of Shetland, it is that the, the situation is different. So as you can see, we cannot generalize one function. And here, when we move to the central North Sea, here is more attractive options. It's very, very crowded here, as you can see, between the offshore wind farms locations and the platforms as well. And we have interconnector here, as you can see, it's going through. Uh, this is one, we, we, we called it North Sea Link, one point uh, four gigawatt. We are talking uh, this is will be commercial next year. So this is a very good opportunity. The non another one, the North Connect in three years time, also it going through, as you can see, some of the oil and gas platform. And for the South North uh, 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 Sea, that we have here one of the ideas uh, that this is uh, the Dogger Bank, to have like a, a hub, energy hub, which include different uh, uh, options. And also, there will be nearby the Viking link. So this is one of the ideas. However, after we had a very important meetings with our uh, colleagues from uh, Lloyd's, ADB, Shell, CNR, Sinop, Chrysler, uh, we discussed all these options. And we had a very useful and interesting uh, workshop in Aberdeen early this year. And we agreed on fix it five options to be taken further for the technical assessment. The first one for East of Shetland, we agreed that the best option for uh, these uh, uh, architectures, it will be, we have here a dedicated wind farm, which will be in, uh, supplying the power to the platforms, and then the platform will be connected to buzzers. So we agreed that maybe the best options will be the Ninian Center will be the power hub, which will feed the Ninian, other Ninian platforms and nearby facilities. And we will have the options, of course, we don't want to build energy storage. So we will have also uh, a gas turbines here on the platform to supply the power, especially as you know, the wind, not sure it is intermediate. And <clears throat> for the west of Shetland, it's very, very innovative approach here because basically, it is totally different story. We have here very, very gross in the area of West of Shetland. We have different uh, future uh, new green fields. So we start by saying, why not to have the hub at Clear Ridge? And the power here will come from three different sources. One from Shetland, mainland itself, and one from the offshore, and another one from the onshore. And this is in the light that we will have the Shetland uh, 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 with uh, uh, 600 megawatt as well. And for the Central North Sea, uh, we have two options. We focused why not to study, uh, we take Basel, uh, Buzzard as the power hub, but here in these options, we will have uh, the integrated solution, the ones that like we talked about it. We will have wind farm connections plus the onshore one. This is the first scenario. And for uh, actually option number four, to take onto account the options if we will be connected to Caribbean countries. Why? I will talk about it later in more details, because this is, will give actually a, a new features. But this will be like onshore connecting, but from uh, Caribbean country instead of the UK. 
finally, we saw the study. Is it the small facilities like with soul facilities can be just tapped to the onshore, uh, sorry, the offshore wind farms that already exist, like Horin C2. We talk about 1.4 gigawatt and it will be uh, uh, going to the uh, onshore. So, why not to be connected directly to the local uh, wind farm? Then we start the project phase three, which it is a technical assessment. So it's a few very uh, high level technical assessment. First, try to understand the electric power capacity and identify the power technology that it will be used, the power uh, 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 architecture, the cable size, type rating, the weight and the footprint of the adopted technology. And finally, we have estimated uh, implementation cost and it basically the CAPEX cost. So for the potential power architecture one, the overview assessment here, as we I highlighted, we agreed that for East of Shetland, we will have a dedicated uh, floating wind farm here, will be just feeding the power to uh, uh, Ninian Central, and then the power will be distributed from Ninian Central to the nearby platform. So the first thing that we need to do to understand what are the available and the demand power on the platform itself. All right. So uh, this is by engagement with our colleagues in CNR. They provided us with the numbers. So we know the amount of power which help us to decide how much power will be decided the wind farm. And this just a zoom of the locations because it's very important to know also the distance between the platform and so on. Then we agreed that we, we, the wind farm that it need to be uh, uh, designed, right? Uh, it, it was able to have it just far from the platform with five to six meters, but we thought that it will be better to leave more space, not to, to, to avoid overlapping with the lines to field uh, around the area. So this is why we decided to have it at 15 kilometers and we designed it at 100 megawatt. We use 10 turbines the uh, 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 each at 10 megawatts. This is just uh, the layout of the structure of the turbines and how it is be. And it is, of course, this is a standard. The distance between the turbines should be 13 uh, uh, multiplied by the rotor diameters. And uh, we take into account uh, the capacity uh, uh, factor and the capacity, which we call the capacity density. Uh, for UK, it's around 5 point megawatt per kilometer uh, square. This is why we used around 5 uh, megawatt per kilometer square. So this means the area will be around 20 kilometer. And then we start to see the distance. Of course, the distance is quite small. So the option of EC will be the best. Uh, however, we found something interesting that the power on Ninian Central it is at 11 kilovolt 60 hertz. And the next one, uh, LO and North, we, we talk about 6.6 .6 kilovolt at 60 hertz. So in, for this case, we found that we will have different options. The first options that we uh, take the output from the uh, transformer on Nanyan Center to uh, uh, another, just uh, to another, to, to the input of the transformer on LO and North or we take just the cable which come from the wind directly to the second platform, or the third options that we have the two transformer on San Union itself and avoid any uh, of extra equipment on the other platform. And option four, we have it the same like option three, but it is cascaded instead of parallel transformer. And finally, Repeating again option four, but try to uh, remove totally the gas turbines on the platforms. And as you can see, every option here has its advantage, disadvantage. Uh, and always you will find pros and cons. And depending on the applications and what uh, are the driving factors, you will decide. But what we did after we designed, uh, we went through the design of the cables, of course, the AC cables. 
uh, for the system because everything here we have it easy. We used uh, XLBVs across linked uh, polyethylene cables. It's very famous uh, uh, technology and it is very robust. Uh, generally speaking, there is nothing here we can pick it up except that you will find the current is quite huge in cable two in option five. Why? Because now everything depending on San Ninian. So it's a proper really hub, which distributes power for the other locations. We did the same thing for the transformer. We designed the transformers for the whole uh, uh, design, all right? And of course, the weight, you'll find it different from one option to another, all right? And this is why it gives indications that the weight factor it should be taken on board when we decide. Then we did estimation of the cost uh, with the help of our colleagues in Sea Land projects and ABB. Uh, we, they provided us with the data. We will find, unfortunately, the dominant part of the cost will be for the offshore floating wind. Uh, this is the main part of it. Basically, when you go to see the cost, the main part of it will be the offshore uh, farm and all other bits will be no comparison with this amount. However, when we go for the electric grade component, we'll find option five, it's uh, the highest cost. And when we compared here in this table, the different options, all right, uh, from all perspective, taking into account the cost, the weight, uh, uh, the facility that it's provide. So I think it will be a good compromise to take into account or adopt option three, all right? Uh, uh, and this is just to give you indications, we are talking about 6.3, uh, uh, 6.2 actually uh, uh, mi million pound per megawatt. This is high or low, it depends of what you are comparing with. We cannot generalize it. But this is expecting value as it is in industry right now. All right. So, just to summarize, this is just utilize installed local floating wind for feeding network of isolated oil and gas platform. What are the technical or technology challenges and innovation gap? First, if we will go for full electrifications, energy storage, of course, must be installed at the float wind side or the platform, unless of course you will have the backup. Feeding the compressors, which it is one third of the power by going for electric motors, it's very efficient, no one can deny, but it will lead to higher size cost and weight, of course, restrictions as well or challenges. Leak of available energy management control, this technology does not exist right now between uh, how the system will operate efficiently without any power quality issue. This should be also taken into account. High capex, of course, for floating wind and subsea cables. The subsea cables for floating wind need definitely, uh, uh, because actually convention subsea cable, uh, uh, there is no problem. It will be the foundation to the seabed. And for the floating wind, the dynamic cables should have what we call it superior strains that it can be able to be connected or disconnected and they will be bending all the time. So basically this is what affect the lifetime of the cable. All these things should be taken into account. One of the ideas that we are also, uh, it is on the table, the why the wind, floating wind here to not to be uh, actually moved depending on uh, where is the power or distributed power of the platforms. This can be one of the options. So this means that you need a quick disconnect and reconnect option as well. Just move to the second architectures. We did the same thing exactly, but here the challenge is totally different. It's required huge amount of power to be connected and it comes through three different sources. And the main challenge that the main grid itself, it is with very power capability. It's around 50 to 100 megawatt on Shetland in place. And plus the Shetland network or Shetland Island, it is not connected to the main grid in UK. <coughs> With these two into account, we find that here the system will be more 
uh, challenging in the design. We went through the same concept. We also calculated the demand and the generation power in the area. And we, <coughs> excuse me, we selected the location of the offshore wind farm again in the Lionsist area. And uh, uh, we designed, uh, it is now one uh, giga megawatt because the power will come through three different sources. One gigawatt from the offshore wind farm, 500 from the onshore wind in Shetland, on Shetland and 100 megawatt from Shetland grid itself. And the total power here, we are talking about 450 megawatt. However, the power demand is expected to reach 800 megawatt in the future. So we designed the wind farm. We went through exactly the same uh, uh, structures, but the challenge here is a little bit different because we will have the substations which collect all the power on uh, 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 onshore, uh, 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 actually with the other uh, onshore wind power. Then we selected where to choose the locations. We went through different investigations, but we came with ideas that the best options will be Yell, and we designed it for the onshore as well, uh, the systems. And then we found that we have two options here. We connect the system in AC, everything it is in AC, although the distance 50 kilometers and 57 kilometers, but the power here around 1.5 gigawatts or the second options to use a DC, all right? But here, of course, we'll add power converters. The power converters here is a huge uh, uh, piece or equipment here, which will be added to on the system itself. So we compared the two technology. We went through, again, the power cable design for the DC and AC. We calculate the losses uh, for both option to be aware about uh, the advantage of using a DC or AC. And actually, there is something very interesting here. You can, of course, the DC will be with lower losses. However, you can increase the cross-section area of the cable of the AC to compensate the DC charge current uh, uh, in the cables. Uh, this is one of the options. Or other options, use normal. Uh, cables in EC, but you will add a reactive power compensator, which is much cheaper, of course, compared to the technology. This is what we did. We designed the transformer, the cables. We went through all this. And again, we calculate the cost. And here, of course, the number of the offshore uh, uh, farm, it will be quite expensive compared, again, because it's a floating wind, all uh, the depth of the water more than 60 meters. So we don't have an option. And then when we compared the post technology, losses wise and cost wise, of course, uh, uh, you will find option one is cheaper compared to option two, the AC one. But again, as you can see, the majority or the dominant part of it, it will go for uh, uh, the offshore wind. And when we compared the amount of power compared between them, you will not find huge difference because again, the dominant part will be for the offshore farm. And we can summarize here, the up Shetland here, it is uh, providing the power, uh, the large scale wind farms, and uh, this is will be pure clean energy. The technology the challenges here, the available space, of course, a, a, a clear reach, it will receive around 1.5 gigawatts. This is huge amount of power. The equipment here will be huge. So definitely it may face a problem of this extra electric equipment. Again, lack of uh, uh, available energy management, high capacity cost of the installation and the power quality equipment, of course, on the platforms itself and the same things. Also, we need to add here, we may need to upgrade the onshore power grid, may be required to be uh, upgraded to, to the import or export power, and it need more. Uh, uh, also, one of the options that it has been announced by ABB using subsea substations. This is maybe will help to remove some of the equipment from the top side. Uh, power architecture three, same. A study, the only uh, interesting bit here is that we have the poles, as I mentioned, to co connect 
the offshore farm and plus the cable from onshore. And uh, this is one of the interesting studies that it can be one of the options for the central North Sea. We went through the same concept exactly. We designed the cables, designed the forms, we designed the amount of power that it will be required. Uh, uh, the power, the, the forms, the wind forms, basically we have a massive amount of the lenses area here in, uh, in six and seven. So we went through the design. However, here, uh, Buzzard as a power hub, it should be able to bi-direction the power flow with onshore. Why? Because we will have here, let's, and if I am going to select it, I will select Peter Head, of course, substation connected to Buzzard directly with the 57 kilometers. Uh, and this will be bi-direction. So the extra power, which it is not required for the surplus power, to feed the platforms, it will be sent it to onshore. And during when there is no enough power to feed the platform of buzzard and nearby platforms, the power will be transferred from onshore. This is why this should be by direction. This is why the option here, which we propose it to use HVDC with full controlled converters in both sides, right? And we compared as well if the connections from the offshore farm, it is DC. So this is only the two options that can be taken into account here. The same things, study, design the cable, design the transformer, design the converters. So almost same concept. And we found here losses wise and uh, compared the cost. Again, uh, option one will be cheaper compared to option two, uh, because again, the power converters, it's actually high cost. And comparing the cost, uh, we found option one is cheaper. And as you can see, and this is what I would like to highlight it here, the cost per megawatt, it keep going down and down from option one, from architecture one to architecture two, architecture three. Although, of course, I totally appreciate the different factors. But when you have here integrated option, the cost will go down. For uh, power architecture three, the challenges. What are the challenges here? Of course, providing power to nearby platform from hub with different frequency. This is, will be very challenging. Upgrading the onshore power grid here at Peterhead, we may need to do so. Uh, cross uh, sector regulatory requirements with uh, the renewable sectors, with oil and gas sectors. And of course, future technology developments in the power electronics converter cost and size will lead this is to be spread it. Just uh, for potential architecture, for uh, the only thing that I would like to highlight it here that why we connected to Norway or other European countries, because basically the carbon footprint here in Norway is very, very low. And this is thanks to that the majority of their power has come from hydropower. So this is actually very interesting driver for uh, UK credential operators. If you are looking to decrease their uh, footprint, carbon footprint, this is, will be the uh, good option for them. But of course, there is a challenges behind how uh, you are going to have uh, uh, this uh, arrangement. Uh, uh, and again, what can be the cabbage cost because it's very far distance and the cable here will be so, but it is one of the options that can be on the table. Option five, or potential architecture five, is the nearby uh, 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 facilities to be connected to the uh, offshore wind farm that exist. Uh, we found that this is very interesting option, all right, and it can be done. There is no any problem. However, there is two options here. We studied if we we'll use a top side or C plus. Uh, 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 subsea technology. And we find the subsea technology, of course, more expensive compared to the top side. However, it's not much, it's just 10%. But of course, it will give uh, uh, the flexibility and the space on the platform itself if it is required. Uh, the challenge here, of course, connecting two cross-sector regulatory requirements between the renewable sector and oil and gas, we need this type of coordinations. And of course, using subsea substations, we add more, of course, 
top side, it depends of which option you are going to take. So just to summarize our outcome and the recommendation for the future, basically after this 18 months, we can that the majority of the offshore oil gas installations of the small medium power demand. Uh, so no power or no platform, it's more than 80 megawatts uh, and uh, the smallest one 2.5 megawatts. So let's say the majority five to 20 megawatts. Uh, and this is why the small pool power grid concept, it's very essential to be taken on board. The best power architectures, of course, it depends on different factors. Uh, uh, however, clustering the UK clean touches to area, this is the best uh, options for solutions for the future. In electrification projects, all right, that uh, four conditions should be considered like lifetime, uh, age, space, weight. Uh, for full electrifications, maybe the greenfield will be much cost effective. Uh, and of course, west of Shetland and central North Sea are the most in growth uh, area in the future for the coming 20 years. And not all options are, of course, suitable for brownfield. Uh, 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 so it depends of like option five. This is the most or it basically is dedicated to brownfield. The old platform, uh, which will end in few lifetime, should be taken into account. And I think uh, gas turbine interconnecting will be the best option for them. And the connecting directly from onshore is not always the best option in terms of CO2 emissions. I highlighted this before because onshore uh, 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 emissions, it's 214 gram CO2 nowadays at least. Maybe in the future, by adding more renewables, this number will go down. But cost-wise, due to the majority, also cost-wise, it is not the best options because the majority of UK container service oil and gas platform, it's more than 150 kilometers. Integration to offshore wind farm, it's the main key technology for the future. If uh, uh, the operators looking to decrease their carbon footprint, including of course, energy storage uh, system or and mainland connection, of course, for security of the supply, tapping to HVDC interconnecting, such as Viking link for the center of connect for the center North Sea platforms uh, uh, such as buzzards because I think it's it's very near to buzzard and North Sea link uh, all this is a promising options however uh, why it's promising because the cost will be much lower than connecting to the onshore of course however regulatory framework is not available right now and uh, the infrastructure and technology just to tap from the HVDC and this is my area of expertise, of course, is not simple. It should be taken into account in the design stage. Integration uh, of energy system, including other energy uh, options, uh, this is very important, like hydrogen or carbon capture uh, uh, system uh, storage. It's the optimal choice for long-term solution for UK container ships. So these hubs should be connected also to other bits like hydrogen or carbon capture. This can be to maximize, of course, the value and minimize the cost of these low uh, emissions. For potential power architectures, uh, we have planned or proposed these short-term solutions, but again, this can be minimized along the UK potential sales for the offshore oil and gas installations and reduce the dependency, of course, of the open cycle gas turbine. Just my last slide, I know that time is flying. The key growth region of the UK international shelves is in west of Shetland, and this photo from uh, Oil and, uh, and Gas Authority. And as you can see, we have around 2 billion of dollar uh, uh, of equivalent, uh, of oil of equivalent, and uh, with large development project in clear and uh, Rose Bank as, and Combo, as you know. Uh, West of Shetland will be very innovative grid. Uh, the structure of it's very innovative, uh, uh, especially for the green field. It, and the existing uh, Shetland power grid is not provide estimated power. We need more in-depth studies. Definitely, I will propose to take into account the energy storage and the coordination between them. This is how we and uh, both 
uh, examples for the Central North Sea and for West of Shetland, very good uh, examples for the integrated systems, which we are aiming to see in the future. So this is basically, uh, uh, and of course, yeah, adding, we have to have a, a, a power modifier, or actually we called it as a system to be operated with multi functions, to be able to integrate all these type of sources together in harmony without any failure of the systems. Because I heard just uh, last year, one of the electrified platforms they face problems from the electric motors. Again, because the power quality issues was not taken into account. And it has been mentioned by ABB that around 75K per day will be the cost of poor uh, power quality of uh, the platform. And I, that's it for me. Sorry for taking more time, Greg. That's okay. Um, I, I will leave my camera turned off uh, because of uh, bandwidth issues and hopefully we'll be stable enough. There's been quite a number of questions raised, um, but we do have a hard cutoff at 12 o'clock. So what we will do, um, and this will come as a surprise to Khaled, is we'll work our way through as many of the questions as we can and then any that we do not uh, get to, then Khaled and I will get together over the next couple of days and we will provide answers so that when the recording is put on the OGTC website, uh, there will be a small document with the outstanding questions uh, with some answers to those. Uh, I think that's the, the best way of managing given the time and given the number of questions. Uh, so the first question that was asked was what is the benchmark electricity generation cost on oil and gas platforms? Uh, did you, was that looked at as part of the project at all, Khaled? Uh, uh, no, actually we didn't, we didn't study the benchmark of the oil and gas platform, but of course uh, we, we don't have a solid numbers, but I, 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 can, I can expect it, of course. So, so but, but generally speaking, we didn't see how much the power consuming, yeah. but if uh, they are using the, uh, the, the convention sources, so of course it, we are talking about from 10 to 20 uh, pounds per megawatt hour. This is the conventional one by using the gas, but uh, exact number on the platforms and the technologies, because again, unfortunately, this uh, type of information is not available. But because they are using gas turbines, and uh, this is well known uh, uh, technology, so this is what I'm going to expect. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question was, has the residual lifetime of oil and gas platforms been studied against the timelines for realization of the offshore wind farms, as shown in the GIS? Uh, my understanding is that in doing the, stu the, the case studies, it was the platforms considered were all, all ones that had reasonable uh, life expectations going forward. Yep, this is actually what, what we try to do, but, but I totally agree. We need uh, to, to, to take this into account because the aging of the platform, it's a key element. And this is uh, why we, we, when we came with the idea of the power hub and its locations, we were struggling to find the optimum uh, location. And this is why by the engagement with the operators, we came with this suggestion because this is what they are expecting. The lifetime of these platforms still will be uh, for another 10 to 20 years. This is why we came. But like I mentioned in my conclusion, that it's not a big deal because the idea itself of what we are proposing, it can be mimicked and repeat it in another locations with another platforms. So it's still it's the numbers and the factors and the conclusions that we came with, it will be almost the same. Yeah. Uh, the the next, one, next question is rather an interesting one is, um, for floating offshore wind, realistically, will the technology be developed and deployed quickly enough to meet the demand for operators targets before end of field life? And I think it's related to what you just 
said and you know i think the the big question with the deployment of offshore wind is the time scale that they operate to because of the regulatory environment they operate under uh and that's probably as big a, a hurdle as anything else i don't know if you want to add anything else Khaled. I totally agree, Greg, but, but, but the challenge, in general speaking, when we say offshore wind, yes, the technology for offshore wind, the bottom, uh, the fixed bottom, it's available and it is now very competitive, the prices, like last year, the prices we were talking about uh, 40 to 45 pound per megawatt hour so it's competitive and there is going forward to this one and this is would be available option on the table however for the floating wind the story is a little bit different because of course the cost is still it is double the cost of the floating uh, sorry the fixed bottom one and this is why we we need more investment and more effort in this to take the cost down uh, unless it will be very difficult to convince the operators to spend and invest in this sector. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, what efficiency is assumed in the power demand estimates uh, that you put together? Uh, you mean you mean for for the estimation for the CO two emission? Yeah. It, yeah, how, yes. Any feel for how much uncertainty that brings in or how important better information on power demand, not just fuel consumption? Across right. the I do believe, uh, because of course we used estimations uh, from the CO2 emissions and the intensity factor, We, as I mentioned, we take it from the website, but they have uh, mentioned on the website, they used uh, 25, uh, uh, I think 25 or 30 uh, uh, percent. Yeah. And uh, to, to me, to me, it is a reasonable number or as an average, because as I mentioned, we have some platform efficiency very, very low, less than 20%. Yeah. And some of the new gas turbines, we talk about 40 and 40, more than 40 plus. So as an average 25 to 30, I will accept this. And I think, I think what needs to be highlighted is, um, where the operators were willing and able to provide demand figures those were actually used in the modeling uh, in some cases the modeling is initially done with the estimates derived from the uh, co2 levels but then updated with actual numbers provided by the operators concerned in terms of what they regard as the platform uh, current demand and expected demand going forward Yep, yep. And, and, and adding to this as well, uh, Greg, that we found some of our estimations very near to the actual values, and some of them a little bit, they are different with 10%. Uh, percent. So uh, this is why it gives us uh, actually uh, enough confidence that the estimation, it is around this number. Yeah. Uh, well, the next the next was more comment that um, there has been there are existing um, connections from one platform to another uh, with electrical cables. Uh, so yes, it, yeah, well, I think it's important that we recognise that you know connecting platforms together for electrical supply is not a new idea. Uh, no, no, no. What we're looking at here is taking it from to a wider level. Uh, two, two, two different things. Yeah, I know very well that there is some of, uh, of even uh, 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 we mentioned between Dunbar and Alwyn North, there is a cable already there and there is a, it can be used to feed the power. Uh, however, what we are saying here, not just a cable to feed the platform and the cell, but it is a matter of coordinations between the two generators to be able, basically, if there will be another generator on the other side, to coordinate the operations to optimize or to have maximum utilization. Because the idea, you would like to run the gas turbines at the maximum efficiency. And this will not be happening unless it is running at the rated power all the time. And again, this is, will be difficult if 
you have only one gas turbine for one platform. So the idea of connecting the platform to optimize the operation, to enhance the efficiency, and to get rid from some of the gas turbine on some of the platform if you can do so. And another thing, but there was no time, of course, to talk about it. We, even if we will have a backup gas turbines, you would like them to operate in on-off operations, not continuously. Because if it will be continuously connected, even if it is not supplying power, the amount of the CO2 emissions, it's around 75% of the normal operation. So this is also should be taken into consideration. The, the next question is in the mesh radio or radial arrangements, the host platform equipment, does it need to be rated for the full load on the network with the corresponding increased weight and size? Yes, not, not, nothing is free. So this is engineering. So yes, you will have better reliability, better coordinations. Uh, uh, the system will be able to provide it from different sources. But uh, however, but don't forget it's the concept. It is like the radio, uh, the ring uh, connections at our home. So always the power. Yes, we will add more cables, right, between all the sockets. But the idea again that the, uh, the current will be higher, but it is not for huge difference, right? So this is why. But you will have the flexibility to uh, maneuver, let's say, and uh, and coordinate the operations. So uh, nothing is free. Yes, you will pay for extra cable for extra size, but from the other side, and uh, you will enhance. And this is why we again we will need the optimization. So. Maybe when we optimized, we will not say that uh, this is the main source bec because, uh, of course, I, we didn't find time to explain this as well. If, if you have six or seven platform, you may have one of them will be mustard and other slaves, or you will have rotating mustard. So what does it mean? One of them will lead the transfer of power, and if something happens, the second one will be the next mustard and so on. All these ideas, it has been discussed at research level, but in different subjects. So I think it can come now to study it here in more depth to see the options. But I totally agree. Yeah, you will add, of course, extra cost, extra uh, 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 burden on the platform. But from the other side, you will add more, enhance the performance, and you will enhance the reliability of the system. Mm -hmm. So really, it's going to be a case by case basis as to whether it makes sense, uh, as with all absolutely, these. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Greg. Yes, it's case by case and it depends on the applications. But we never ever, this is why we came with these five uh, potential architectures. We cannot generalize one option for everything. It depends on different factors and it depends on the area, uh, the nearby platforms, how much is the power of the platform required as well. This is another issue. If you have a facility with 2.5 mega and you have other facilities working at 50, 60 mega, so never ever this one will be the master of the smaller one and so on. So yes, case by case, we cannot generalize it. And I think this will be the last question we can get answered. So the rest, as I said, we'll look to answer um, when we place the recording on the website. Um, the, there was a, a Rystad study earlier this year in Norway on realizing floating offshore wind. Now, ABB was involved with that study as well. Was there an exchange between the two projects or were they undertaken separately other than ABB involved with both? No, unfortunately, we were we were not involved. It, but I yeah. heard about this study, and uh, uh, but but we were not involved. It. This was not part of the activity uh, yeah. with us. So we're pretty much at the the twelve o'clock. I think it's um, there was a lot of information in that presentation, and the recording will be made available, as we've mentioned. And we will put answers uh, to the questions, although I think we are looking at some of the comments and uh, questions. We are, in fact, running into the downside of this, uh, the webinars because there's a lot of very interesting comments, I think, that could lead to very good discussions 
if we were to do it the old style and now break for lunch somewhere. Uh, unfortunately, um, we can't do that. So uh, we'll do our best in answering the questions, but it would be useful to have further feedback uh, on who would like to be involved in discussions on taking this work forward, because clearly for each of the um, cases studied, there were some common uh, areas where further work is required. Okay. Yeah. I was just sharing some information again. So, you know, there is, in order to move forward, there is further work to be done. Um, and we would appreciate, obviously, having an understanding of who's interested in being involved in the discussions as we work out the scope of the next stage. Yep, totally, totally agree, Greg. And I just, I just uh, uh, again uh, show just my email in case anyone would like to approach me with more details, any questions, further discussions. I will be more than happy, of course, to respond. Just uh, my name at trust.ac.uk. Yeah. And yeah, we will put everything up on the OGTC uh, website in the next few days. Uh, and again, to emphasize, and we will endeavor to answer the questions that we weren't able to answer here. Sure. So thank you very much. And uh, at that note, one minute over time, uh, we will depart. Thank you. Thank you very much.